Hi everyone, it's Professor Hall. Welcome back. So now we are going to talk about The Blazing World, um, which has a much longer title that is in your text. Um, and that is the description of a new world called The Blazing World. So sometimes this is called The Blazing World, sometimes it's called A New Blazing World, and it is by Margaret Cavendish. Again, if you haven't seen the summary, please go back and watch that before you watch this, because that um, that way this, this little lecture will make a little bit more sense to you. So one of the reasons that I chose this work, I find it really interesting, again, as a piece of proto-science fiction, we see some elements that will be in science fiction stories later on, and certainly fantasy um, as well, with the uh, talking bears and the, the worm men and the louse men and the ant men. Um, these are all talking creatures. So similar to the story we looked at by Lucian, here we have kind of mythological or, or at least um, uh, similar to fairy tales and folk tales, we have talking animals, which do appear in later works. And I think um, if you look at the work, say, of C.S. Lewis, um, and he had was a scholar who mentioned um, Margaret Cavendish and her husband in some of his letters. And I think you can see this work as kind of... Um, influencing his works as well. If you don't know C.S. Lewis, he wrote the Narnia Chronicles, but he also wrote a space trilogy. Um, the idea in this story that you have these sort of fanciful talking creatures, which is sort of part of it, right? It's supposed to be drawing you in a tiny bit. Um, but there's still a lack of plot. Um, it's still based in large part on philosophy, the question of how would a utopia be structured. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute, looking at those social structures. Again, that's a big part of science fiction, not just the science, but also the social and the humanity um, uh, idea that um, advancements also should be in the realm of the, the social realm as well as the scientific realm. We also, though, in this story, do have a lot of scientific um, talk and debate um, between this character the, who very quickly becomes the Empress. Before that, she's the lady. Um, but between the Empress and these various schools of creatures. So we have um, the bear men are experimental philosophers. There's another group that's astronomers. There's another group that's chemists. Um, there's another group that are politicians. I think those are the foxes that are politicians. The giants are architects. Um, so she has a lot of um, discussions with each one. She has many discussions with each one of these groups. And the reason that I chose this for you is because I think it is a very interesting look at um, early on in, um, in or fairly early on, I guess, in, in recorded history, but a woman trying to ask why. Why does this particular phenomenon happen? So she asks about um, lightning and thunder and she asks about snow and she asks how exactly do telescopes work and are they helping us or are they kind of tricking our senses because we can't see everything? How do microscopes work? How do magnifying glasses work and can we use them to not just magnify but to make things smaller? What would that kind of be like? Um, those kind of scientific inquiries, I don't know that Margaret Cavendish could have published a nonfiction work asking these questions and still be taken seriously. She, um, as I mentioned in, in the other lecture, she was denied entry into the um, the scientific institution at the time, and, and I think only let in um, really not that long ago. She was the first woman inducted, and it was uh, in recent history. I can't remember the date now, but I know it's in the lecture. So I don't think that she could have um, had these inquiries into science in a, a nonfiction way, but here... The, the idea that it's it's fiction gives her a little bit of leeway so that if she's wrong, she can say, well, 
come on, it was the ape men who were chemists, right? So um, it's it's supposed to be fantasy and it's asking a few questions about what if, but it's still fiction, right? It gives her a little bit of leeway in that sense. Um, and certainly as a woman looking at something that is fictional and a little bit fanciful, a little bit satirical, um, I think she has more room to play with. So um, I think that this is a really interesting work in terms that it was written by a woman at a time when a lot of women were not writing and a lot of women were not um, in the 1600s in, in Great Britain, um, were not scientists or philosophers. Um, that it looks at these social structures, that it looks at scientific advancements, and that it, it has these questions, these speculations. What, why? That's the first question. And then what if? What if we could do this? What if we could do that? How would that look? So let's talk about the social structures first. The book is part utopian story. So we have this woman who is, again, as, as we saw with Lucian, um, in a ship, um, a boat, and she is uh, born aloft, <laughs> kind of like the, the story we looked at previously. And she's taken to the North Pole um, because of this disaster with this ship. Um, I think it's interesting that they, they knew about the North Pole, but nobody had been able to really travel or get there because of the cold temperatures, right? So the idea even of traveling to the North Pole would have been um, a little bit of uh, a, a part of the science fiction that we kind of take for granted. Yeah, there's people at the North Pole and the South Pole and there's explorers and all of that, um, but not at that point in time. So at the North Pole, I think we could again think of it almost as the edge of the world, even though by this point they have the understanding that the, the, the earth is round, um, which some people today don't. But anyway, um, kind of almost at the edge of the world, coming up to the North Pole. And at that point, she's whisked away um, into this other um, fantastical realm. So we have then this look at a uh, utopia and her first questions are how is this society structured so what's the best way to structure a society that could lead to scientific advancements and i think it's very interesting that it's a monarchy and this is one of the first questions and i'm just going to read you guys a little if i can get it i'm going to read you a short excerpt here um she says, she asks them why they don't have many laws. And she notes first that none was allowed to use or wear gold, but those in the imperial race, which were the only nobles of the state, nor darest anyone wear jewels, but the emperor, the empress, and their eldest son. So the lady then marries the eldest son and becomes empress as well. Their priests and governors were princes of imperial blood and made eunuchs for that purpose. Um, that's taken a little bit out of context of the word that <laughs> isn't really clear there um, because I've cut some of this. But then we come a little bit later um, and she asks, why are there not that many laws? How come you don't have a lot of laws on the books? And they answer that laws made many divisions, which most commonly did breed factions and that broke out into wars. Next, she asked why they preferred the monarchical form, having a monarchy, having a king and queen um, form of government before any other. They answered that it was natural for one body to have but one head. So was it natural for a politic or a political body to have but one governor and, um, and that a commonwealth. Um, so I think that it's it's interesting. I mean, she's coming from a, a system where there is a monarchy, right? Um, but the first thing she does is kind of confirm that, that a monarchy is the 
correct social state that we should have and that if it's done correctly we can have this kind of utopian existence where there aren't that many laws and if there aren't that many laws then people can't break them and if they don't break them then there's no punishment and therefore then there's no war there's nothing to really argue over um which is a very interesting almost libertarian view of a monarchy that there would be a monarchy with a head but really not that many laws um we then have the the breakup of the society in terms of it seems like the the humans are ruling and that these talking creatures and also some giants and things thrown in there um they're broken up into different schools so it's very interesting um that in the in the utopia they're they're living harmoniously but they are living kind of segregated as well so there's bear men who are experimental philosophers bird men who are astronomers the fly men uh the fly worm and fish men natural philosophers that's um biology ape men are chemists the satyrs which you have a little bit of mythology thrown in there the satyrs are uh, physicians, the foxmen are politicians, um, then we have mathematicians, we have orators and, and people who are looking at logic, we have architects, and they're living in this place that's basically like made out of gold and jewels and, and just this wonderful blazing um a uh the, the it's a blazing world <laughs> that's the title right so i think that um that this is very interesting and 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 did she do this because she's living under a monarchy and she wants to still stay in favor she was a, a duchess at this point or does she really believe that this is the best way for things to be structured we don't really know but then she takes a look at religion. And I think that um, for the time, particularly, th this is a very interesting way of, of looking at um, religious systems. She is, is, you know, some of this is a satire. Some people say it's not a satire at all. Um, other people say that this work is a satire. But she's asking about religion and she says, do you have um turks which she she means by that um people of the muslim faith she asks um do you have christians do you have turks do you have jews like what what exactly is your religion and they answer her that they don't know those religions but that they do all worship the one god so this is a time period before um, a religious development known as universalism unitarianism universalism unitarianism says that there is one god that all religions are worshiping kind of in their own way and so they kind of take pieces from these different religions and um put them basically on the same level to say that um this is how we are going to worship God and look at God and, and we learn from different religions and humanism to understand God. And that's basically what she's kind of presenting in this work. Um, so just to kind of explain that a tiny bit. Um, so again, in terms of being a science fiction work, I think it's interesting that we look first at the social systems and then we look at the scientific advancements and that it's very clear that they kind of are informing each other. Um, when she's talking later on to one of the one of the, the talking animal groups, she sees that there's division within their group about how to understand or explain some of the scientific phenomena. And she says, as Empress now, as their ruler, as their one head, right? She says, it's fine that you're having these debates. Um, I'm going to allow them to continue because that's how we get scientific advancement. But don't have the debates outside of this group until you decide what's going on here together as one group. Because if you have debates outside of this group, it could cause factions and war amongst the other people. And I think that this is really a fascinating but very important point to make, that um, 
when we are trying to look for scientific advancement, debate is very central to that. Even today, um, there are that's why things are peer reviewed. <laughs> you have a study, you put it through peer review. People who are in that field look at it, they debate, was this a valid study? Was it not a valid study? Can I replicate it? Can I? Do I have a study that kind of contradicts what this study says? And that is how you come to scientific advancement. Different people come up with hypotheses, they test those hypotheses, and they see which one is correct. So in terms of a, a very early understanding of the scientific method, um, I think that this is spot on. It's interesting to me that she thinks that if you share that with people and you bring other people into the debate who are not experts, that this can cause a lot of faction. And it, honestly, we're, I'm, I'm taping this from home because we're in the middle of the coronavirus, right? Even if you look at how people are dealing with that, there's scientific debate about the efficacy, um, the efficiency, or, or how well masks work right? And that debate then was carried into the public. And now you have a lot of factions, people who want to wear masks, people who want to wear two masks, people who don't want to wear a mask at all. And this is the kind of thing that the, the, the empress is trying to prevent. So I think that there are some parallels that you can kind of take from that. Um, then we get into the actual scientific advancements. There are some things that she's surprised that they don't know about. And so then the empress as a woman is in this position of being able to tell these scientists about different things that they can do and try. Um, when she is first taken up, she's talking about the ships um, that they're using to rescue her. They don't have an understanding of a lodestone, um, so it seems possibly that they don't have a compass, but they do have ships with a type of engine. An engine here is capitalized. I don't know why, um, but it is. Um, they have a ship with a type of engine that takes in air and uses that air for propulsion. And um, I find that just <laughs> completely fascinating that um, she kind of looked at, if you look at like a sailboat using the wind for propulsion, how could that be more efficient, right? And having them um, have these ships that take in air, like a little motorboat, taking in the air and using it for propulsion. Um, however, the ships are, um, some of them at least, are made from leather. Um, so again, we see some things that are uh, spot on and some things that are not, not quite so much. Some of the other scientific adv advancements that um, are looked at in the excerpt that I gave you, um, they talk for a while about astronomy and the, the sun and the moon, and they talk about how now they have these telescopes um, telescopes would have been around for about, I think, 40 years at this point um, after uh, Galileo. They do still have um, an Earth-centric model, it seems, from her descriptions. So some people were questioning that model and some people not, um, that the Earth was here and that celestial bodies would move around it versus the Earth moving around the sun, which is a heliocentric model. Um, so I'd like you to kind of look at that, how they're kind of in the middle of this debate. What does the Earth look like? And now that we have telescopes and we can see things, um, what does that mean? Though, But they're looking at spots on the sun and the moon. They're calling the sun um, a, a, a rock that burns, um, which is uh, fascinating. Um, but again, trying to figure out why. What is it and, and why is it and how does it work? And I love this part. Um, I'm going to read to you here. Alleging an old tradition that it should at some time break asunder and burn the heavens and consume this world into hot embers, which said they could not be done if the sun were not fiery itself. Um, so the idea of having um, solar flares, of a sun, 
There we go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, a sun exploding in like a supernova, which some stars do um, as they are dying. The idea that this would happen um, and that uh, she's talking about it and, and having um, a, a pretty good understanding, um, at least in an early sense, a fairly good understanding that, that this could occur, that a star could go supernova and explode. The idea that it's a rock and that you can look at um, the stony body of that rock, not so much. Um, the stars flying from place to place, they debate this for quite a long time, and they really ask, is the telescope a good invention? Um, I want you to kind of look at that part in particular. There's some discussion over whether this deludes the senses, meaning we can see very far, but are we seeing things that are accurate or is it not quite strong enough? Are we not seeing exactly what we need to see? Um, and then we come into a discussion of microscopes and a discussion of magnifying glasses and, um, and, and, how they are different than telescopes, again, putting some um, uh, moral value on them. So I would like you to look for that as well. Um, and, uh, and then the part that I did not give you of this story, but I did talk about in the... Um, the summary. The I did not give you the second. It's it's quite a long work. Um, and later on, Margaret Cavendish writes herself into the story, and she becomes platonic lovers with the Empress, meaning that they have a very close relationship. There may be some sexual tension there between the two of them, um, but that's not consummated. And the way that Margaret Cavendish comes to her is by very supernatural means. But Margaret Cavendish made some um, comments that she wanted to create a world that she was basically like the ruler of, right? So the Empress is kind of her, and then she was like, that's not good enough. I need to be in the story. Um, but I think that in addition to being a proto-science fiction work, this is also a proto-feminist work. So we have an examination of social, um, culture, mores, and structures. We have an examination of scientific advancement. And then we have this question of what is a woman's role in this world? What could it be? Um, the fact that the empress is allowed to talk and, and have this scientific debate with all of these different societies of scientists and Margaret Cavendish herself was really not allowed to do that um, is something that she's she's basically like fixing here. And it is a call for sure to have um, women have an equal voice. And it's also a note that women can make valuable contributions to science and that if you allow them into the discussion um, that they can prevent too much um, discourse and, and, and conflict from happening because that's what women do, uh, at least in this story. And that, um, there are things that she knows that they don't. Again, the, the idea that certain advancements might not really be working too well. The idea that, um, they, they don't have the lodestone that, that she is aware of. The idea that you could take a magnifying glass and then flip it um, and in some way, and instead of looking at things close up, look at things as if they are very small, um, like a whale is now no more bigger than a, than a little tiny gnat. Um, these are things that she helps them with. And so I want you to watch for the ways that the Empress has agency as a woman in this world and how she didn't have agency at the beginning of the story um, when she's put on this boat. Um, so yeah, just to summarize and, and put everything together, um, proto science fiction work doesn't have too much of a plot quite yet. It's a lot of um, philosophizing and, and speculation. Two, the way that a little bit of folklore, a little bit of fantasy is kind of mixed in. Three, um, the discussion of social structures and mores and culture and religion um, and how that interacts with 
for scientific advancement, um, what things are beneficial to society in terms of scientific advancement and what things are not. And then lastly, the role of women in this story, particularly as it is written by a female writer. So that's it. I hope that you enjoy this and I, I hope that you can kind of see how this work and Lucian's work are moving us along toward the development of science fiction, which we're going to look at next time with Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Thanks everybody.